Okay, I didn't ask for your life story. Hello, you're listening to the podcast, So There I Was. That's how all great aviation tales begin. A little different beginning this time because, you know, we're just going on and on and on. Episode 100. What? How did 100? Yeah. How did Holy that happen? Right? I know, right, Sticks? No kidding. But here we are at show 100. This one is called Mig- Mignusak. M-G- N-W-S-A-K. My girlfriend, now wife, she's a keeper. You'll she's get a, it. She's a, she's a keeper. She's a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> Quick admin a note. A couple of thank yous to Sal Marinello, our five-time tanker aircraft commander. Chucker's up to seven in his own category. Chucker category. Thank you, Chuck. God bless you. Thank and you, Sal. God bless you, Chucker. All of you. Who have cracked your wallets oh, open? Patreons, yes. So there it was. Dot us slash Patreon and given us money to help bring this show to you. We are eternally very grateful, very very humbling. Yeah. Thank you. And and several regular donors over at so there it was. Dot us slash donate. It's a direct donation button we have on the website. Thank you. Great guest this week, as usual. C one thirty pilot extraordinaire by the call sign of Woody. Figuring across Woody. this gent long before he was a second lieutenant. Yeah, he's got quite a story, and it's inspirational because it's all about stick to yeah. and not giving up. Right? I'm not sure I would have become a pilot if I'd have had the obstacles he's had. Well, they said yeah. no. They said no. No. So They said no. You're too old. Yeah. No, nope. sorry. The bottom line here is persist. You know, you got to push through. Persist. 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 Yep. That's right. Never give up. Had a couple show yep. titles we thought about there. Uh, it was a misdemeanor. <laughs> Wound up leaving Louisiana to, uh, you know, escape justice, maybe. <laughs> Fig knows more about that story than do I, but we actually didn't get to that one in detail in there, and that may be on purpose. That's probably good. That's probably, probably a good, good reason for that. <laughs> hey, you know what? I also had written down, aircraft commander says, what are you doing? Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go back up in the front office and mind your own business. <laughs> well, he's a talker. He tells great stories, and it, you're not going to be disappointed because there's a, there's a lot of good stories here. Absolutely. You had to Absolutely. apologize for his stand-up routine. <laughs> yeah. He didn't even give us a sample of it. I guess it must have been that bad he apologized for it. I don't know. <laughs> well, it was because it was a Christmas party slash holiday party, and I guess it was maybe a little too ripe well, for that environment. I don't know. Wind cells. I'd have been okay well, with pilots it. Pilots, for God's sakes. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone was laughing Send but it. the leadership who was afraid of losing their wings. <laughs> uh, yeah. Send it. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you what. We're talking about it. You ought to hear Let's it for away. yourself first hand. Yeah. yeah. It's time to Here get out of the way. Episode 100, baby. 100. 100. Episode 100. Woody! At night, <laughs> in the world's smallest cockpit, on the tanker, through the weather. Oh, and to the uh, tanker crew who uh, did that. Thanks a lot. We really appreciated that. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. There I was, crossing the pond, and you could see that I wasn't exactly fun. So there I was, in Marone, Spain, one day, and I had a really bad sprained ankle. And uh, we had been going back and forth at the beginning of Operations Iraqi and Enduring Freedom, flying from Spain down to Iraq, Spain down to Iraq. And the aircraft commander came up to the crew. I was a young loadmaster at the time. And he says, we got two options. We can take 332,500 pounds of gas and fly direct back to Travis Air Force Base. Or we can hit a tanker two times all the way across the United States and head over to Hawaii. And in unison, without skipping a beat, the entire crew looked at the aircraft commander and said, let's go to Hawaii. And so there I was. And that is how all <laughs> great aviation tales begin. Greetings, everybody. Repeat here. Coming to you from home in New Hampshire this week. 
here with my co-host, Fig. Are you home, Fig? By the grace of God, I am at home, and what a way to open the So There I Was story. What which a, hey, which episode is, number, Fig? <laughs> this is 100, baby. 100, the baby. Centurion. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Woody. Hello, Woody. Welcome, Woody. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys so much for having me. Oh, this is cool. Who'd ever thought we'd have got here from there? One <laughs> and yo, here we are. I know. 100. So is- tr- truth in lending clause, Woody is a personal friend that he didn't start out as a personal friend. Actually, I didn't like him much when I first met him, but I'm sure we'll get into that. So speaking of get into that, <laughs> there is quite a story here on how you got into aviation, but let's start with what piqued your aviation interest. Yeah, where'd you start? You know, it goes back to well, when I was a young kid. Grew up, grew up in Colorado Springs, and my dad actually was. Don't hold it against him, right? He was a helicopter pilot for the army. <gasps> <laughs> yeah, right, right. He he was a prior enlisted guy, so he was a, an artillery mechanic in, in Vietnam, and and then he, he he met he met my mom. They got married. They had me, and then he went to warrant officer school. Oh, my my mom was pregnant with me. And, and he came back and he flew Hueys right there in Fort Carson. And so I was, I was pretty fortunate to kind of grow up, like exposed to that right out of the gate. And, you know, when I started getting old enough, every once in a while, he'd take me out to Butts Army Airfield and he'd, he'd show me around the Hueys and, and, you know, the Chinooks on the flight line. And I was like, man, this is, this is really cool, but you know, he'd take me back into the ops office and, and I found a way to sneak away. And I'd end up in the bigger part of the hangar where they had maybe a maybe a King Air uh, or a citation and, and I'd just go crawling up on him. And my dad tells the story the best. He says, you know, one day he remembers this this maintenance guy brings in, he's like, Whose little blonde headed kid is this? And my dad, you know, he <laughs> says, Yeah, that's that's my boy. He says, Well, I, I just caught him, you know, sneaking on the, the king or out in the hangar. And so as much as I love helicopters, I really knew that I, I, I loved airplanes. And and so my dad kind of started that with just being able to take me out there. And my mom kind of furthered it by just, you know, my dad would also fly Cobras, uh, which he flew out in Korea. He went down to El Salvador with the Huey, did some stuff down there. But while, you know, he was away, my mom, you know, she would, I'd say, mom, would you, would you take me out to the airport? Like, you know, nerd moment for a five-year-old kid. Like who doesn't want to be around airplanes? It was me. Who? Who doesn't? Me. Yeah. So, you know, my mom would take me out to, take me out to the Colorado Springs airport, the old terminal. And, uh, you know, you didn't need a boarding pass to get through security. So she'd right. walk me through security and we'd sit there and, you know, I would just, you know, watch a TWA 727 pull up or, you know, maybe catch a couple T-37 tweets flying around. and Or maybe there was nothing there, but just to be at the airport was something. As a kid, I, it, you know, I had every airplane book. I'd, I'd look at the sky. I could tell you what it was. And and it just became kind of like a Rain Man thing for me, really. <laughs> nice. And, 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 it, and it just grew. But that was the, the very beginning of it. Definitely happened from... From a from a dad that was involved in it and a mom that supported it, I was very fortunate to have those two key elements. Just kind of be like, well, you know, I mean, if that's what you want to do, then, then go do it. And so All right. that's kind of the beginning. So I, I I don't. So let's let's get to this part. You you didn't become a pilot right away, so. Talk through that process, because there's, uh, there's some lessons to be learned here. Uh, oh, yeah. But, I mean, you know, some life lessons, too. And also some inspiration. So talk us through, you know, you got out of high school. Did you start, did you start college? Did you go into the air? No. You, know, no, you, you didn't, didn't do VFR direct no, to flight I, school. I, no, absolutely not. Come on. Are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> Why? That's too damn I mean, easy. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I, I started working at the age of 16. You know, I, I bagged groceries and, you know, I always wanted to, you know, it was still airplanes, airplanes, airplanes. And, you know, even, even in like high school, you know, the, the guys would be like, Hey man, we're going up in the mountains. We've got beer that someone bought us. We're all underage and we got, you know, we got girls and we're going to go party. And I'm like, Hey man, that's great. I got like a Coca-Cola and Microsoft flight simulator 98 or, or 95, whichever one it was at the time. And I'm going to fly a 737 from, 
from JFK to LA. Like, thank Nerd. you, but no, thank you. Um, yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, so, you know, that kind of was the deal. But, you know, nonetheless, I, I did run with some of those kids back in the day. So, you know, there were a couple of things that kind of happened. And I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go live with my sister in Louisiana. They were down there in Fort Polk. And I went down there and and I, and I worked for a, a contract company as a civilian on the battlefield. Well, that was cool, but I ended up getting a little trouble. And and uh, the best no. thing was, the best no. thing was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The best thing was for me to just go back to Colorado. So I, I went back to Colorado. Wait, and, hold on uh, a second. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, yeah. Uh-huh. Did I hear, you didn't say it expressly, but did I hear I had to leave the state of Louisiana for well, legal reasons? you know, kind of, sort of, <laughs> in a way. All but, right, uh, all right. I, I'm not going to pry. No, it, it was, hold, it was hold on. Good. I got I to gotta say, I didn't know that yeah. was an option. Right, I would have left right. the state well, of Louisiana. Yeah, I had a right. choice. <laughs> I had a choice. Right. When, I, um, I might have run into a legal issue or two myself at one yeah, point in I time in I Louisiana. Trust me. I mean, it was a it was a lawless land. And well, anyway, you know, it was it was a, it was a simple possession charge of a controlled substance. It was a misdemeanor. You know, to this, to this day, the more you, know, you miss, the meaner you get. Is that that's the, right? <laughs> anyway, so I get back to the house. And uh, and I and I look and I had to go back to Louisiana for to to meet with the man, if you will. And okay. and and I had applied for a job in the newspaper classifieds to be an airplane cleaner. And I was like, wow, this will be great. Well, I get down to Louisiana. I get a phone call from the air, the the guy at the airport. He says, hey, we want to bring you in for an interview. And I said, well, hey, I'm down in Louisiana. Got to go through this real quick. And he's like, that's fine. Call us when you get back. So I come back to, to Colorado and I meet up with the guy and I get a job for an older airline back at the time. And the, the job was, you know, the overnight airplanes come in, you offload the bags. And then after that, you'd go up and you clean the airplane. So it was part time. And, and I loved it. It was great because, you know, once the pilots left, you know, you climb up in the cockpit, I became brake ride qualified. So you had to start the APU to move the airplane off the gate and, and that was like heaven for me. And so that was really cool. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, funny story. One night after, you know, one of the guys that was training me, he says, Lamont, here's, here's what you got to do. When, 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 we, when we put the bags on the baggage claim, we open up the oversized door after we put a couple bags on so we can look at, at the people at the baggage claim. You know, maybe there's a cute girl out there or something. So I'm like, well, that's neat. So we put all the bags on the baggage claim and start the baggage claim. He opens up the oversized door. We throw a couple skis on and I'm like, wow, look at all these people, you know? And (laughs) that night I was driving home and I pulled up next to these two gals at a stoplight that I saw at the baggage claim. And I rolled down my window in this 1983 Ford Ranger. And I said, Hey, she rolled down her windows. I said, I offloaded your bags, nothing, another nerd alert, you know, couldn't come up with anything otherwise (laughs) other than that. So fast forward, I, I go become a supervisor at at the Eagle County Regional Airport for the winters. And I had a great friend and mentor then at the time. And I was always talking to the pilots, you know, as you'd see him. And I say, how'd you get to, how'd you get to where you're at? How'd you get to where you're at? You know, some Air Force Academy, Naval Academy. I flew this, I flew that. And I'll never forget this one guy that I met on a 757-200. And, and he looks at me and he says, you know what? He says, I was a loadmaster. He says, I was prior enlisted. I, I, I did all my stuff on my own. And then I commissioned and here I am. And I was like, huh. I was like, that's really neat. So I started looking into joining the Air Force and I ended up talking to my mentor about that. And he says, you know what? He's like, I, I always wanted to fly. He said, but my eyesight was too bad. He says, you know, I really wanted to be a boom operator. And I said, well, you know what? I mean, I, I'd, I'd sign up to be a boom operator in your honor. You know, he was, he was a really good friend of mine that taught me a lot, just some great life lessons growing up. And, and so I, I went and talked to a recruiter and I was able to put four jobs down. And the first one I selected was to be a boom operator. The second one was to be a load master. The third one was airborne battle manager. And then the fourth was to be air traffic control. I told the recruiter, I, said, I, I don't want to do anything unless you put me on an airplane. Yeah. Right. And so, so he said, okay, well, we'll put you down for a boom operator. And I said, well, all right, well, that's, that sounds great. And so 
I, I joined the delayed entry program. I took the ASVAB. I did all that stuff and, and scored high enough to, to do either one of those jobs. And I remember getting the phone call from the recruiter's commander. And he says, oh, Lamont Wood. And I said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, he says, uh, you know, based off of your, your history in Louisiana. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> man, it, it comes back. He says, we don't, we don't feel that that's probably a good job for you to be a boom operator. I said, well. Okay, sir. You know, so so then what? He says, but you could be a load master. And I said, well, all right. I mean, that's still pretty <laughs> great. Like, you're still going to give me the job that, that that I wanted to do. So, so I enlisted, and you know, shortly after I enlisted, you know, September 11th happened while I was in training. <sighs> wow. And uh, wow. you know, yeah, we all we shit all know got real like, real fast. Shit didn't got it? real yeah. real fast. Shit got real real fast. All right. And so. I didn't, you know, my, my first thoughts while I was at training was I didn't even know what had happened. There was a, a maintenance guy that comes in. There's three of us in, in class, and this maintenance guy comes in. He says, man, y'all ain't going to believe this. And now Altus, Altus Air Force Base, Oklahoma, he says, man, y'all ain't going to believe this. Man, like a Cessna in a 737 done ran into the World Trade Center. You know, it's like, all right, man, I mean, I, I get maybe like a Cessna, but – the 737 right. is like, that doesn't, that doesn't make Come any on. sense. Yeah. Come, Come on. on, man. Come on, man. And he's like, no, it's on the auditorium across the way. And, and we went over there and we saw that. And, and then, you know, we saw the second plane hit. And, that, you know, my first thought was they're going to pull us from training. They're going to give us a, a, an M16 and we're going to go to war. Now, mind you, I didn't join at 18 years old. I, I joined at 22. So after I graduated high school, I went to Louisiana. I came back and I did some odds and ends stuff, you know, just kind of just kind of farting around doing some fun yeah. things before I actually. So you were, you were kind of an old man, so to speak. Yeah, uh, I was. Uh, uh, when you went through the, ba- you know, b- uh, basic training. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, right. Uh, I was constantly reminded of that. You know, by by, and, by and, guys in the class that were like parent permission to get in, you know, and yeah, you you were already legal age to drink, right? But, in all uh, fifty states, all fifty of them, yeah. every one of them. Nice. Um, the question so is, then, uh, did you? Had you uh, yet? Well, yeah, I, yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah I it. dabbled. I dabbled. There was, okay. you know, it was it was pretty cool. I, I met some great guys and. In the beginning, before even Altus, you know, it'd come into class. There were these three kids that sat on the other end of the table. This was the enlisted air crew undergraduate course. And there was three guys that were from Wisconsin. And they'd all come in and they'd take their, their BDU top off and they'd sat there with their black shirts. And one of the guys, he was my age. And he was like the big bulldog with his little bulldog. And then, and then another guy who later on you'll hear about, Getty. He was a 17 year old parent permission guy, but those guys would sit over there and they looked so tough, but they weren't like, I couldn't stand any of them. And I sat with this other kid from Minnesota and we'd sit there and look at those guys and say, those fucking Wisconsin guys, you know? Anyway, (laughs) so fast forward to Altus, most of us ended up going to Altus because we were all ended up on C5s with the effects, with with the exception of the, the Minneapolis guy, he went to C130s and, you know, so I'm thinking we're going we're to go to war. And they're like, no, no, you're going to go through training and you're going to finish training. And and we did. So come back to Travis. That's where we in process on the C5. And I mean, it was incredible. But at the same time, that's all we did. You would leave Travis. We'd fly to Charleston. We'd pick up a load. We'd hit a tanker. We'd go to Spain. You'd go back and forth to Iraq, however many times it took. And then you'd fly back to Travis. You'd have, you know, maybe four days off to do your laundry or to mail your bills away, you know, doing the postal stuff. And yeah. then, and then you go back to work. So, but nonetheless, I still knew I wanted to fly and I had a great time and met some wonderful people along the way. And so there's some great stories later on about, you know, those, some of those missions, but, you know, I, I, I started taking some flying lessons while I was on active duty. And then I came back home and I joined the reserves and I, I was a load master on C-130s out there in Colorado Springs. This is after and, uh, your active duty stint was over, right? That's right. Four years. So, the, so the four, four years. It, had you started taking online college courses or anything? Still hadn't been to college yet. Still hadn't okay. been to college. Still, okay. So so when I get out 20 So now you're like 
48. Like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. There you go. So and you mentioned 26. also, yeah. as, as long as we're interrupted, I want to stop here too and mention you said BDU. So that at the Army calls and the Air Guard calls that the battle dress uniform, which is the yeah, camouflage right. utility. That's okay. Right. Oh, good job. That's good right. job. Yeah. That, that, that went right over my good. bald head. Man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. drag. So, so, you know, I, I started flying the 130 and, and, and still hadn't started college, but there was a couple of really good people that had joined the unit right around the same time I did. And we all became very good friends, a couple of flight engineers, and I met some really great load masters. And, you know, we went on a couple of deployments to the Middle East, which was new to me because we didn't do that in the C5. And, yeah, you were and then a couple of us said, you know what? I mean, we have the opportunity right now in this unit, didn't know about this active duty, but we can go to school, get our degrees, and they'll, you know, they'll hire us and we go fly C-130s. Nice. So that was cool. We all started going to college. We went to the old Embry-Riddle distance learning campus where I did most of my homework in the back of a C-130. And, you know, I'd land, connect to the Wi-Fi and submit my assignments. And and that's how, that was my college experience (laughs) for the most part. Going TDY and, you know, still working, getting paid and using my GI bill to, to, to go to school. And, and then, so another buddy and I, you know, we, we worked pretty aggressively to, to go get our private pilot's license and, and finish that. So we did. And so now everything was kind of starting to come together and just, just a little over halfway done, but nonetheless, the squadron was like, well, you know, when you guys are about a year out, you know, let us know. And so I, I was about a year out and then, you know, the squadron then at the time was kind of like, well, I don't know if we can do that. One of my buddies, he was just about done. The other two of us were still waiting to finish up, but he was young enough. The guy that was almost done, he was young enough to, to not have to worry about it. And so then I said, well, I, I mean, I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket. So I went and rushed a guard unit up the street that flew F-16s. And now I'm getting kind of desperate, but, you know, by by my own fault, by not starting college or doing all this sooner, I'm coming up on the deadline for the age. So I go up. What what is that deadline? And is it still in place? Well, it's not. So at the original time of of this evolution, Mm -hmm. which was circa 2009, 10 timeframe, was 29 and a half. You had to be in pilot training by your 29 and a half. Okay. And I was right at about 28 and, and with about a year and a half left to go in school. So uh, I'm grinding away, grinding away, but I say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go up and talk to these guys here up in, in, up in Denver and Buckley. And, you know, I went up there, I rushed, hung out with all those guys. That was great. And then, you know, the squatter back in Colorado Springs was like, why are you going up there? Like, we need to, we need to start doing this now for you guys. So all three of us, you know, interviewed right there. With with the, with the unit in the springs, and it was great because it was it was a lot of really good dudes, uh, squadron commander, and they put us in one after the other, and and at the end of that, they said, you know what, we're we're going to hire all three of you guys, so we continued take the AFOQT, take the TBAS, still finishing up school, and then someone says, well, there's this blanket age waiver that the Air Force Reserve Command is going to put out up to the age of 33. So the other buddy of mine that was a little bit older. And I, we hear yeah, that, that we're like, out. well, this is great. And so we get our package, we send it, and and then the, the package comes, it goes away. And it's crickets. It's dead silence. My one buddy, he's young enough, because he didn't need an age waiver, so he gets the, he gets his approval. And then my other buddy, Ponch, and myself, eventually the, the squadron commander says, hey, Woody, you know, the OG's got some news. You want, you, you should go talk to him. And I said, well, what, what do you got? He's like, I, I can't tell you, you know, if it's good or bad, but just go talk to the OG. And I said, all right. So I already knew like it wasn't good. So I went to the OG. Do you and spell I Louisiana? Said, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> well, that process was crossed too, because that was another waiver, you know, that had to be in there. And so I talked to him and he says, Woody, he says, I just want you to know, he says, uh, yeah, it didn't happen. It was it was denied by the two star at the at the Africa level. And I said, All right, Africa. you know. And you know, Africa, Air Force Reserve Command. 
the uh, yeah. So and so with that being said, fast forward to another story that you know General Goldfein for the Air Force Command Chief Staff. When I mean, he had said once, he was like, you know, my son wanted to be an F sixteen pilot. I just tie this into this and. He says, you know, it didn't happen, and he had to just take another vector. So that's what I did at that time. I took another vector. I said, well, you know what? Here's the deal. I'll I'll go get my own ratings, and and I'll focus on my enlisted career and go go become a chief master sergeant. Like, that makes sense. That that sounds perfectly great to me. And so I start doing that. I go to senior non-commissioned officer academy so I can make master sergeant, and I do that. And uh, my then-girlfriend, now wife at the time, there was a job opening that came up to teach at the Advanced Airlift uh, Tactics Center in St. Joseph, Missouri. And I said, well, what do you think about this? She says, I don't, I don't care. She's like, your career is a little more important than mine. You should apply. She's so, like, I'll go with you wherever you go. Right. And I'm like, what a, what a girl. Yeah, that's She's keeper, keeper right there. Okay? Right on. Keeper. Yeah. So I apply and, and I get hired. And so early 2013, we move out to, towards Kansas City, Platte City. And that's about the time I met Fig. It was uh, right around 2013. And uh, I was the loadmaster instructor over at the schoolhouse. And very shortly after I had gotten there, the inbound commander, Otis, he shows up. And he's a great dude, former Air Force Special Operations Talon C-130 Navigator, you know, did a stint flying the C-160 Transall as a foreign exchange officer in Germany, which was super cool to hear that kind of story, which is a phenomenal airplane. If you know nothing about it, Google it and check that out. And so he shows up and he's like, hey, Woody, you know, and he's he's very you know feedback orientated. And, you know, he's telling me, hey, man, you're, you're doing a great job. And and, and they kind of let me run as the enlisted guy at the schoolhouse. And Fig can probably attest to that. Like they just, you know, I got to do what I wanted. I got to teach, create lesson plans. And, and, and they got to teach that to the people all over the, you know, the globe that came out there to train, which, so that was really cool. And then I got a phone call from a friend of mine in Montana. And he calls me up one day and he says, Woody. I said, what's up? He says, we're looking to give age waivers for the state of Montana for navigators. And I said, man, I said, that sounds really good. I said, however, let me sleep on it. I said, you know, I, I, I think that sounds great. I was like, but I either want to fly the airplane or I want to load the airplane. I don't, I didn't want to be a flight engineer. I didn't want to be a, yeah, not that there's anything and, wrong uh, with those things. It but was, I said, this me, is your personal wrong choice. At the time. Absolutely yeah. not. That was me. Right. Holding on to that. And, and so I, you know, I, I sleep on it. I, I talked to my then girlfriend, now wife at the time, then same girl, of course. And she's like, honey, just do whatever you want. Again, keep her. And so I, I go to Otis the next day. I say, hey, sir. I said, you know, they're giving age waivers to, to navigators in the state of Montana. He says, Woody, you should hear what they're doing for pilots in the reserves right now. And I said, really? He says, why? Are you interested? I was like, yeah, I was like, I tried once before and it was denied. He says, well, get your shit together. And I said, okay. So I already had my package. I already had my testing. I had to, I had to go revisit a physical and and I did it and I, I hand it to him and he's like, okay. And so, you know, being in St. Joe was largely centralized for, you know, a lot of tactic stuff that came out in the, in the mobility air forces community. All these people would come out we had a symposium. So you got the network a lot. But it also had some heavy hitters from the reserve components that would come out. You know, it wasn't uncommon to have a, a two-star or three-star general out there to give a speech as a, a capstone speaker. Well, it okay. just so happened that Otis knew a lot of those guys. And I was able to get FaceTime with these guys. And, you know, as the package got sent through the wickets, Otis had said, here's the deal. We can make this work. Like, we can, we can get you the age waiver, but... The conditions are this. Well, the biggest condition was is it's not going to be for a unit of your choosing. You're not you're not going back to you're not going back to to Colorado Springs. Like you you're going to go to an undermanned unit. So I had you know I texted Poch and said, Hey man, I was like, the reserves are starting to do something here, and and I kind of cued him in that. And one of the guys in his squadron came from Niagara Falls. 
which is this flying bison brewing company in Niagara Falls. And he says, Niagara Falls is always hurting for people. And so I come back and I tell Otis, I say, Hey, so what about Niagara Falls? He says, get in touch with them. So, I mean, you know, even yeah. though I had all the stuff, Bobby's, you know, yeah. Otis still made me do all the work. So I, I call up to Niagara Falls and I start talking to him and Ponch and I get all our package stuff together. We go to the board, we fly out there, we interview and great, great, great unit. And I, I remember a lot of those guys from being deployed in 2005 and six with, with, with the Springs unit and, you know, walking into the squadron in my blues and seeing all these guys. I'm like, I remember you, I remember you. And, and so, you know, I had this nice spiral bound package with my, you know, my, my, my cover letter, my, my letters of rec, my resume. And, and we interviewed and I felt it went really good. And then I was down in Fort Huachuca on, on one of the, you know, tax center training sorties down in Arizona. And I was hanging out with a crew from Reno. They were a lot of fun. That was the beauty of that job is you just got to meet so many people from so many different places that I still talk to to this day, you know, some even over in Belgium and, and Germany. It's just, it was neat. And as I was talking to this guy, my phone rings and it's, it's the hiring gal from Niagara Falls. And she says, Lieutenant Wood, or, you know, Master Sergeant Wood, then I'm sorry, at the time, she says, Master Sergeant Wood, she says, we met and we talked about your stuff and, and we would love for you to come up to Niagara Falls. And I'm like, I'm elated, you know, I hang up the phone. Nice. I said, thank you. Absolutely. This is super cool. I call my, my girlfriend, she's now keeper. wife at the time. And she's a keeper. And I call Otis, I tell him, and I call my buddy Ponch, and he says, man, he's like, I just got the same phone call. And I was like, dude, this is incredible. Now, mind you, I'm, oh, gosh. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask, this what, time, how old are you? I'm 30, 77. I'm 34. 34. I'm 34 years old. 34 plus 77 minus a couple extra. So 34. 34 is the... As my final answer, 34 years old, I get there the I get the I get the call that says, "Hey, you're you're gonna you're gonna do this," and so so the final steps were were to you know for for Niagara Falls to make sure that the package goes through, and and then there was the board, and then the package goes to the board, and then it's silence, of course, and I keep working doing my thing, and my buddy Ponch calls me, he says, "Woody." I said, what's up, man? He says, did you hear? And I say, hear what? He says, uh, none of the packages from Niagara Falls made it to the board. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, they never left the base. They dropped the ball. They didn't Ugh. get it. Great. And I'm Great. like, dude. So I go straight to I go straight to my boss. I don't know if you remember then at the time. Yeah. Skinny. Yep. Skinny. Skinny, skinny big, was big the skinny. Call I go skinny. I said, guy who was the... Was the opposite He's of skinny. skinny. As a matter of fact, he looked like a WWE wrestler with a shaved head. As oh, and yeah. he was not a small oh, yeah. human. He was a uh-huh. NFL offensive tackle size. Only he wasn't fat. Oh yeah, yeah. He was just, everybody called him skinny. Yeah. So I. <laughs> yeah, and I go to skinny. Oh, it's like I tiny. Said, in, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. The nicknames that always coincide with the guys never make sense. Skinny, yeah. tiny, never. It's always the opposite of that. Well, I wanted to ask about Otis. Was that the town drunk from Mayberry? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No. He, he was a heavy hitter, man. He was yeah. a heavy hitter in the community yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. Uh, I was I was extremely I, I can, fortunate I can to have him around. That, uh, Otis it was a heavy hitter, big time, and he was a true leader yeah. in every sense of the term leader he he got got the best out 100%. of all his people and he took care of them right all right enough said on that okay yeah nice so so skinny i go up to skinny i said skinny i said my package didn't make it man like uh i'm not i'm not i'm not sticking around here at work today like i'm going home he's like woody i get it you know and i, I get in the car and start driving home and Otis calls me up and he says, Woody, what happened? I said, the, the package never made it. It never made it. It never left the base. And he's like, okay, okay, well, let's see what we're going to do here. 
And and that is exactly how, how Fig had, had stated it was a great way to put it. You know, he sprung into action. He didn't he didn't stand by idly and you know ask me questions and say, well, you know, better luck next time. No, he he started raising the flag and, and, and calling people. So then I went I went home and I sat a couple days go by and then next thing you know, I was I was kind of informed of like a, a supplemental board that was gonna convene basically for the two packages that didn't make it. And, and so it convened and that board had been at that point selected that you were good to go. So that was huge. And I'm like, wow, this is, so this is really happening. Like I had no, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, this is, you know, this is the nerdy kid and playing Microsoft 95, you know, not going up into the mountains to hang out with the boys and the girls you know, is, is actually maybe getting a shot at this. And, and so he says, okay, well, it's good. But the, the package ended up getting held up by the, the, the command chief of the Air Force Reserve Command. It got all the way to his desk and it sat there. And Otis, at this point now, they had my orders cut to go to officer training school. I had a class date for officer training school, pilot training and whatnot, but it all hinged on several final signatures that had to happen. And so this is in the end of 2018. And Otis says, here's the deal. Here's what you're going to do. Woody, you're going to start driving towards Maxwell Air Force Base to either do one of two things. You're either going (laughs) to in process officer training school, or you're going to give a capabilities briefing of what we do up in here in St. Joe to the C-130 unit down there at Maxwell Air Force Base. And I was like, wow, like that's a, that's a heavy hitter right there. So I tell my, my girlfriend, keeper. now wife, She's keeper. great lady, lover, keeper. And I said, honey, I was like, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be home in either five days and I'm going to be back in five <laughs> weeks. And she says, I love you. And, and I'll see you later. And whatever you do, right. don't suck, don't you suck. know? Yeah. Right. Don't, don't, right. Right. Don't fart, you know, whatever. So, uh, so I, I, I get in, I get in the car and, and, and it's just solid rain. It's a sheet of rain all the way down to Tupelo, Mississippi. And I get into the hotel and it's tornado watch, whatever. And I'm like, I don't really care. There's an outback right across the street. So I go over to the outback and, you know, I get myself a beer, some prime rib and a <laughs> shot of Jameson and, you know, Bobby, uh, Otis texted me and he says, what he says, still no update, man. Still waiting on this signature. And I'm like, God dang, are you kidding me? I'm like two hours outside of Maxwell. Like, what, what am I going to do? You're going to give a brief, bro. You know? So <laughs> I'm going to give a brief. That's it. Yeah. Like I'm already at the worst case. I'm like, oh, it's happened once. It's going to happen again. Like, you know, I feel like I've got good karma, but maybe, maybe I've, maybe that thing in Louisiana. I don't know. Yeah. You know, this is all falling apart. Maybe. And uh, so the next morning I wake up and I, I text Otis and I say, Hey, I said, what, what do you got? He says, I got nothing. Woody. He's like, just keep, just keep driving. And I'm like, son of a gun. So I pack my shit kind of hung over and I'm, I'm driving down the road. And, and of course, you know, the distracted driving who texts and drive, ah, I surf the internet and do all this other stuff. I'm <laughs> riding down the road and my, my old Blackberry at the time, right? The Blackberry starts blinking and I look and I pick it up and, and all I see is an email from Scooter. He's the operations uh, he's officer at the, at the school, unit. He just and, uh, left. That's right. Okay. So he sends me an email with an attachment and I, I, I'm just driving and I open up the attachment and it's a letter and I see words, 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 and I, I just skip to the bottom and it says, good luck and congratulations on your flying career. <laughs> and what? And I was like, eh? wait a minute. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm like, I, I got to pull over and actually read this email. And as soon as I pull over, Otis calls me and he says, Woody, he's like, we got it done. Go to officer training school. And in process, boom, boom. you're going yeah. to officer training yeah. school. Nice. And man, so I'm sitting off the side of the road and I'm just like, that's surreal, right? Right. Like, you know, it was super surreal. 
totally surreal. So, you know, I call, you know, I call my, my girlfriend, He's keeper. my wife, she's a keeper because we weren't married yet. You know what I mean? You know, we're just going through all this stuff and, and, and I'm like, I can't, I can't believe this is happening. So I'm, I'm, I'm elated. I'm beside myself and you know, I'm, I'm just calling people. Hey, and and, I'm, and I'm this is like, like this is like a Monday, this, right? You know? A Monday when you're supposed to in process. Yeah, it was, it was, I think this happened on Sunday. I, 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 you know, Otis has the voicemail message that I, that I called him when I finally got to the base. I, I believe it was a Sunday and I get to the base. I, you know, I do the obligatory, you know, base exchange shelf check, get a haircut, eat some Subway. And then I, I pick up a 12 pack of Coors and a, and a half pint of Jameson. And I had to go to clothing sales and buy, you know, almost $1,200 worth of, you know, yeah. mesh dress and all this stuff that, yeah. you know, you don't get. And, and I called, uh, I called Otis and I said, Hey man, I said, I just want you to know I'm in my room, you know, and he's got the message and he'll play it every once in a while. And I call my chief load master back in Colorado Springs and, and just, you know, gave him a big thank you because he was instrumental in a lot of, you know, my enlisted career development. And then how, yeah, I kind of, Got a little tuned up. And, How old were you? you know, that was good. That day when you walked on base for officer training. That day I was that? 34. Yeah, Man. I was, I was, I was 34. And so I showed up the next day to officer training school and, and the in-processing commander of the 24 training squadron, I, I looked at him, I looked at his name tag, I saw his wings and I immediately recognized them and knew who he was. And I didn't make any mention of it as I was in processing, but he was actually the aircraft commander on my Finney flight when I left the squadron <laughs> back at Travis Air Force Base. How about that? Yeah. And he didn't know it. And so we just got to talking a little bit. And anyway, so I, I next thing you know, all right, you know, OT, you know, officer trainee, start going across this field and go over there and do your thing. So I just remember schlepping these two big ass bags walking across this field like god dang i feel like i drank a fucking 12 pack of coors and a half so, <laughs> so, so let's just re, let's just recap and, uh, you were showing up to either a give yeah. a c-130 capabilities briefing or b start officer training and you didn't know that's a fact. which way it was going to go when you left the house Nope. Dang. Not until All that right. day. Not until so, that day before. Uh, uh, Sticks, I had no idea. Sticks put a little message across the screen here a few minutes ago, and and I can't argue with that. But let's. Yeah. For anybody listening, what would you say? How? What would you say to them if somebody is struggling to keep motivated towards a goal? What would you say was the key to you never giving up? I would say that it, I would say realistically two things. Like it takes a village, first of all, insulate yourself with the people that, that understand, but more importantly, know you and keep those people close because including your girlfriend, now wife, including my keeper. girlfriend, now wife, because <laughs> she's a keeper because go. those and Otis and Fig, I, I, mean, I can give you a laundry list of people that that I keep close to me because they're great people, but they know me. And and that is is a very, very big thing. Like, you know, there's a lot of negativity out there. There's a lot of there's always right. someone that's against you. There's always yeah, right. it's just it's just the way yeah. it is. That's just that's life. And then the, the second part of that is just, you know, never, never let it go, you know, because when you let it go, the people that love you and know you, that's the first part of that piece is that they're always going to be there to support you. But the support for yourself is never letting go what it is that you want to do and, yeah. and, and, and accept those challenges because that's, that's the defining moments for yourself and, and never, and never be shy to, to talk to someone or, or learn something because I mean, that's it. If, if you live in a, if you live in maybe a shell or you're kind of introverted and, and, and maybe you're not the out outward loud person, like that's okay. But you know, 
leave no stone that. unturned. And however that I love that translates. Yeah. So is, I is it's a big deal, you know. I, I think Fig actually gave away the answer in the question yeah. too. It's like never give up. Never give keep, it up. No many how many times they tell you no, keep keep going until you're past the age when they can't that's say right. yes. You know, and and yeah. that's it. Like and the even then you still made it, you know, from twenty nine and a half. You were thirty four when you started. That's awesome. Fuck, dude. Thirty four. <laughs> I was. Yeah. And then I went all, to pilot training. And I I all these 22-year-olds at OTS, that must have sucked. Yeah, oh, it was a mess, man. <laughs> it was like basic training for grown-ups. You know, I had this I had this tech sergeant, tech sergeant Yee, man. He, he was a drill instructor, and he rode my ass so hard, and he knew it. He knew it. He's like, O.T. Wood. Oh, you think because you're a master sergeant? Uh-huh. And he knew my history. He knew everything, and he rode my uh, yeah. shit. Yeah. So hard. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he was great, you know. I'm uh, I'm 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 Isn't friends with him to this day, and you know, at the it, it's just it was really yeah. cool, and I met some good people. And so, fast forward to maybe a week before graduation, I see I see that lieutenant colonel that was on my finny flight at Travis, and the inbound Air University commander was. At the time, at the same time, this lieutenant colonel was on the Finney flight, was was the squadron commander back at Travis. And so I had keeper. my girlfriend, yeah. now wife, she's a keeper. At the time, I said, I said, I need you to go into my photo albums because I carried photo albums from all the times back at Travis. I, I need you to find this picture. She finds a picture of, of lieutenant colonel... Fitty flight, and uh, she sends me the picture, and I say, hey, sir, I said, I just want to show you this picture. And he looks at it, and he's like, I <laughs> thought I remembered you. And I said, yes, sir. And he's like, well, you know who the inbound Air University commander is? He says, yeah. He says, this is a squadron commander. And so, you know, I graduate. We come walk across the stage, which was, you know, that was that was an incredible feeling in its own because. Uh, Talk about you know, it, it coming full is. circle, and, right, uh, with the people right there. Yeah. Forget it yeah. and, and forget it. So Getty, uh, one of my really good friends, and he was there. And, and next thing you know, I hear this, Lieutenant Wood. I turn around and there's a, there's, we'll call him Gimme. Gimme shows up and he was a squadron commander. He's not one star general with Lieutenant Colonel. Right. You know, right. A on the other side. And he was the, the aircraft commander. And uh, how great is that? <laughs> so, uh, it was, it was fantastic, man. And, you know, a uh, long story, quick one. I'll make it really quick because uh, I don't know how this really goes. And I don't want to, I don't, I know I've been blabbing a Got bunch. Got a lot of questions for you, dude. But there were. Yeah, we do. But, okay. I'll get you this one little part because this is great. So back at Travis, I, I did, I dabbled. I did a little stand up comedy <laughs> at a comedy club downtown called Pepper Bellies. And. So I did that for a little bit, and, and, and then we had this squadron holiday gathering is what they called it. They didn't want to call it a Christmas party because sure, you know, yeah, it's it a holiday gathering. And they said they had me and a flight engineer and said, hey, would you guys MC this? And I said, yeah, sure. I'll do that. So, so, so we MC it, and the party's kind of dry. And finally, I said, all right, I'm going to just do a little stand-up comedy. So I do some stand-up comedy. And – the OGs there, the operations group commander, all these people. That, and, and 90% of the people are laughing really heavy about this. And I get done, and I was like, man, that was really good. And I go outside, and I smoke a good cigarette. Shit. All the bosses are standing out there. Gimme is the squadron commander out there, the DO, the ADO. They're all standing outside, and they come up to me, and they're all smoking cigars, you know. And they said, Woody. I said, yeah. There's like, your, your comedy routine was good. It was funny, but it was not appropriate for tonight. And I said, well, shucks, I'm sorry. You know, they're like, you're still a beeliner, but we need you to come into the squadron in the morning <laughs> to send a massive apology email. So I <laughs> so I show up and I send this apology email. And, I, and, and my buddy Getty stayed behind me. He's like, Woody, he's like, never admit guilt. They separated us. They pulled him over to the other room. And and it ended up just turning into be a really funny thing. So that night after that party, my buddy Getty calls Gimmer at home, Gimme at home, and says, "Hey, why, 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 why are you bringing Woody?" And he calls the squadron commander at home at two o'clock in the morning and says, "Why are you getting Woody in trouble?" 
And so anyway, so that was the same guy yeah. and, and Getty was there and we all got to rehack that moment when I, when I graduated OTS. So. Oh man, I got a, I'm, I'm, I got a question for you yeah. about that. What, what was it like? And I'm going to use a pejorative here. None of you lieutenants write to me. What was it like when you got that demotion from master sergeant to second lieutenant? Okay. Uh, Technically not a demotion, but there's, there's, yeah. you carry significantly more and, and, cred and, as a master sergeant than as say, a second he, lieutenant. Dude, so he did what, what was that cred. like? He, he was a master sergeant yeah. instructor at the advanced airlift tactics training school, which is, which is, which is where I met him. Right. And I, my first impression was who the hell does this guy think he is? And, and I, you know, I thought eventually <laughs> I'm going to have to put this guy in his place and dress him down a little bit. But to be honest with you, I could never do it because every time I had an interaction, he walked the walk. Because he dude. walked the he walk, was huh? A real fucking deal, and that's what impressed me the most about Woody. I thought I thought nice. he was full of shit when I yeah, first met him. I really did. I thought he was full of shit, yeah. and I thought I'm going to get a chance to bust his little full of shit bubble and knock him right down. And no, as a matter of fact, I, I never did. As a matter of fact, he taught me things. So. There you go. Ah, shit. There you go. Yeah, so he uh, had the cred, and now you're yeah. a second lieutenant, a no nothing ninety day. Wonder, he's the oldest second say, lieutenant you know. in the Air right. Force yeah. at this point. That's <laughs> right. That's right. You, you know, it was a pain. I mean, but at the same time, you know, it was just I felt like a lot of these other kids. You know, there was maybe a, a couple other prior enlisted guys, but they yeah. were like senior. They weren't thirty or whatever. Years old. And, mm-hmm. No, they weren't 34 years old. They hadn't been around for, you know, they you know, weren't combat plus veteran years yet. yet. So they hadn't been to uh, war. They hadn't been around no, the world. No, I know. No, no. But, so, uh, you know, mm-hmm. they, they ask questions and, and, and they, you know, I. So, I, so I, I guess I go to, back to my question then was yeah. essentially, you know, what was that like having to, I guess, demonstrate that you had credibility even though you're again, lieutenants don't write to me, even though you're just a second lieutenant, right? You know, clearly with 14 years experience, not, not many second lieutenants have that. And so you're, you're kind of dismissed early on. I, I think at first glance by, by most of those with whom you're around. Yeah. I, I think it, you know, part of it was just, you know, again, I think it kind of goes back to just like having the, like talking to people. And, and okay. I think that, you know, yeah, I was easily dismissed. And I mean, even in pilot training, you know, there were some challenges with some some guys or, or gals that were second lieutenants. They were like, I don't I don't really care that you're 14, you're master sergeant or whatever. But what I, what I knew what it meant to me. And again, that kind of keeping your friends close and, and, and the people that know you, it meant a lot. And but yeah, I mean, it kind of sucked, man. I mean, it went from like, you know, being able to be like, oh, cool. Yeah, I can tell you what to do to be like, no, I, I got to sit here and listen. Like I'm getting yelled at, like it's basic training all over again. Yeah. But, you know, the overall experience, I, I had a really good time just because I was just like, I was just so, I was just so happy to be there. You know what I mean? That it right. was just like, fair enough. I, yeah. I, I didn't really care. I didn't really care how bad of a person or how shitty the situation was. Like, I was like, I'm not supposed to be here right now. Okay. Um, nice. That yeah, cool that's part. true. Fair enough. So yeah, there's yeah. some, some gratitude to be there. Sure. I get that. So, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, let's take a quick break to uh, thank factor who has helped get these first hundred shows to all of you. In addition to thank you to all of you who are Patreon and direct donors on our website. at so there I was that us. I still can't believe we're here at 100. Dude. So we're going to take about a two and a half minute break, hear from Factor, and then come back and talk about Spain to Hawaii, Gilliam and Butterscotch, <laughs> and some other fun <laughs> stuff like that, it sounds like. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking from the kitchen. So there I was, preparing for another bland mealtime journey when I realized it doesn't have to be this way. Buckle up, because we're about to elevate your dining experience with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Whether you're cruising at mealtime altitude or just making a short hop from the couch to the kitchen, these chef-crafted, dietitian approved delights are ready to go in just two minutes. That's quicker than a pilot's witty reply to air traffic control. 
So there I was, thinking it was just another microwave dinner. But then, boom, out comes a gourmet meal that's ready faster than a clearance for takeoff. With over 35 options every week, including Calorie Smart, Protein Plus, and Keto. Yes, folks, Keto. There's a culinary co-pilot for every type of eater. My first officer, the one and only daughter of mine, has already charted her course through the Keto skies. She's hitting those macros like a seasoned pilot. So there I was, fantasizing about breakfast at 20,000 feet. Well, with Factor, it's no longer just a daydream. Pancakes at cruising altitude, smoothies back in the hangar, and more midday bites than autopilot options. And guess what? No prep. No mess. It's like having a cabin crew right in your pantry. So there I was, juggling schedules when Factor flew in to save the day. Choose your meals every week and adjust your deliveries quicker than an in-flight turnaround. In the aerial duel of takeout versus Factor, Factor is the undisputed cockpit king. Luxurious, nutritious, and surprisingly wallet-friendly. So there I was, about to offer you an exclusive deal. Fasten your seatbelts for this one. Head over to factormeals.com slash so there I was 50 and use the code so there I was 50 to get 50% off. That's right, 50% off with the code so there I was 50 at factormeals.com slash so there I was 50. On behalf of the entire crew at Factor Airways, we thank you for choosing us for your mealtime journey. Please return your taste buds to their upright position and as always, so there I was, making mealtime easy and delicious, thanks to Factor. He's back! So there I was. Had to have a little fun with that. Yeah. yeah and Woody hey, came hey, back, hey, too. Can you believe it? I, That's you awesome. Know, I for coming back. You are going to show back up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought about it for a second. He's All right. had enough this of this. Is so, no, no this is cool. great. So, hey, is Woody, cool, I, I am so happy yeah. right now because, you know, I'm, I'm still learning shit from you. All right. So I, I got what before. <laughs> go ahead. But before we, we before we, we go on, Ponch, how, first of all, how, how do you get the call sign, Ponch? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, was shit. A shot that out. makes sense. All right. And, you know, <laughs> That's too know, easy. Yeah, it was, it was, it was too easy, but uh, – Ponch is, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of guys that have shared this journey, and and Ponch is one that, you know, he was he was the other guy that we were we were too old to do this, and it happened for him. So out of out of our group, you know, that's the name that makes uh, sense. Ponch and I were were the same age, yeah. All right, yeah. but that's that's why All that's right. his that's his call. So uh, that's why. <laughs> nice could have been Chip, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. No. But yeah, so you opened the show with a tease going from Europe to Travis or Europe to Hawaii. Gee, which of these Europe? do I oh, want? Spain. Yeah, you're in Spain. Yeah, <laughs> you're in Maroon, Spain. Yeah, yeah. Spain. Yeah. We're in Maroon, Spain. So there I was, and we're in Maroon, Spain, and and so like I was, so like I was saying, most most of the trips started with you left, you left Travis. You'd pick up a load somewhere in Charleston or whatever. You'd hit a tanker, and then you'd and then you'd end up in a stage. And the stage was either in Marona or Rota. And you know, and, and how that would happen is you would show up and you'd go to the bottom of the list. And all the other crews that were there, you know, as airplanes would come in, they would go out. And so they would either put you in a Charlie which a Charlie was like, you had two hours to enter crew rest. So you had two hours before you went into your 12 hours crew rest, or you're in a Bravo and the Bravo they had changed because of, you know, after September 11th and all that, they, they, it was normally a 48 hour requirement, but the way well, they made five day Bravo. And this was an alert status, right? Bravo alert so status, Charlie alert. That's status. correct. So okay. Bravo alert chart is, okay. yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> <laughs> great great crew and we get into we get into we do the we do the charleston we do the ar and we end up in 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 rota the first time we went into rota and we get into rota and there's not a lot of stuff open because we get in super late and of course you know the c5 crews we we like to we like the party i don't see and, that uh, 
there was one place right one place right outside the front gate that was called the zigzag. And I uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't. I'm sorry to say, I'm a familiar. <laughs> that was. Have you ever you ever been at you ever been right. at Marona Road or there, Fig? Where you, oh, you've yeah. been yes. in on the, the parts? Yeah, yeah. So if you remember the zigzag, or if you've heard about it, you know about the zigzag. It's open early, like well, well, open late, I, open early. I don't think it ever closed, so like, buddy. You know, <laughs> I don't. I don't think it really does either. And, and we decided we decided to establish that because it was like two o'clock in the morning or something. And said, "Well, let's let's go let's go to the let's go to the zigzag." And we go to the zigzag, and <laughs> the zigzag is is it is open, it is open it is open wide. And the the two pilots and I, one I'll call the dude, and the other one I'll just call Foxtrot Tango. And myself, not me and Leslie wanted to come hang out, just me and the pilots. And we end up, we end up at the zigzag and uh, there's nobody in there, but the music is loud as if the place is packed and we're doing our stuff. Well, the dude is a, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy, but the dude is pretty funny. Like he's notorious for being able Uh to do the worm, Uh you know, at a, at, at a dance club. And so the dude does the dance, he does the worm. And I'm like, man, he's really good at that. And I go try and do the kid and play, like, you know, hold one ankle, jump through it. You know, if you remember the movie Kid and Play. And uh, as I jump up to try and get my my foot through, it doesn't work out so good. And I catch the back of my calf and I face plant. And immediately my ankle, I just start sweating and my ankle swells up to the size oh of like a grapefruit. And I'm like, oh, boy, this isn't so good. So. We get back. Finally, there was another guy, Patty. Patty's for this. Patty, I'm going back to I'm going back to lodging. Then we go back to lodging and go to midnight chow, get some food, and then end up back at the hotel. And the next morning, I wake up and I'm like, oh boy, and I'm like, I can hardly walk. I can I can barely put my boot on. And I I call the AC, you know, fighting T. I say, hey, I said, I just want you to know, man. Where are we at on the stage? He's like, well, Woody, he's like, I I think we're going to be off today. He's like, you know, do the rice, you know, rest, ice, compression, elevation. I'm like, yeah, I'll do that. And he's a great dude. And so I'm sitting there kind of just limping around my room and I'm in Spain. And there was a gal that I had knew in Spain, not my wife, not my girlfriend. She wanted to keep her. Not a keeper. Not a keeper. (laughs) But sure, she was yeah. nice to talk to every once in a while. So I, it, she, Spanish, she was Spanish up in Marone, Spain. Yeah, no, 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 Air Force, Air Force gal. Okay. And I just happened to call her up. I said, "Hey, I said, well, what are the what are the chances you're down in Rota?" And she says, "You know what? She's I'm actually I'm down here for Airman Leadership School." And I said, "Really?" She says, "Yeah." I said, "Well, room me on." She's like, "I'm over here," and I, and I stop on the floor with my good foot. And she's like, yeah, you're right above me. And so she comes up and we start talking and she's like, so she's like, what are you doing tonight? And I was like, I can hardly walk. She's like, all you got to do is walk down to the taxi, walk into the bar and hang out. And I was like, okay, fine. Yeah. So we she go. Talk, talk me, me into it. So I go and I hang out making great decisions. Anyway, we come back to the hotel. That rest is yeah. unmentionable, but you get the point. And so the, the next day, you know, Fighting Tom calls me up and he says, hey, Woody, he's like, we, we, we got a mission. How are you feeling? You're doing all right? I say, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I, I can get the boot on. I'm, I'm making it all right. And he's like, okay. So we had to go down to Iraq. We go down to Iraq and we do our thing. And, and then we come back. And, you know, at the time, the C5, we didn't have any tactics. Like we weren't doing low level ingresses. Like it was a big, dumb airplane. You know what I mean? And so the tactics were evolving with that and so anyway we, we do our thing we end up back in Marone this time which was the direction to end up going home and uh, and that was the so there I was so you know fighting Tom says all right crew we have two options 332,500 pounds of gas go back to Travis or double AR and go to Hickam and without skipping a beat everybody says let's go to Hickam why not and so 
we're like, heck them. Of course, we haven't been there. You know, we've been we've been back and forth to Spain and Iraq. That's it. Like, and you know, Travis was the gateway to the Pacific. Yeah. So that's all you did back before all of this. You know, you do Anchorage, you know, down the down the Osan, Kadena, Yakota, whatever, Guam, yeah. Hawaii, and, and like it was great. But I never got to do any of that. And so I'm like, of course, let's who would go want to Hawaii. go? Hey, who would want and, to go uh, to Hawaii? Or, so I mean, we do. Right. In the right. middle of all that? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so we take off. It's late. And we fly all the way wow. to Hawaii. 19.2 that's, hours. We get gas insane. somewhere over Boston. We get. It's insane. Like, you know, as a loadmaster, I, I started out, like, eventually going into the bunk, like, I'd, I'd, I'd lay down with my flight suit on and my boots on. Then the boots came off. Then the patches came off and everything came out of my pockets. And then before you knew it, I'm, I'm sleeping in my underwear and my t-shirt. Right. Like, you got to get some rest, bro. Yeah. You know? And so I'm, <laughs> I'm cozy and we take off and, you know, I, I go into the bunk. I lay down. I wake up like two hours later. And I'm like, how much longer do we got? I'm like, it's 17 no. more hours. Now what? And I'm like, now what do I do? <laughs> You know, so so I make make some make some you know put some chicken in the oven, make some you know chicken Are you listening to this and repeat? I eat lunch and I'm like cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's like, here, yeah. here's here's my advice to you for a flight like this: <laughs> eat till you're sleepy, sleep till you're hungry. <laughs> I know repeat. It. I know it. from a true long haul professional, it. right? And I, yeah. Oh yeah. So then I, yeah. So then I eat, and I'm like, "Well, now how much time we got? Sixteen hours. That took an hour, you know. Yeah. So I might, I might have found a way to get some nicotine down, and and that took an hour. It's still fifty. So I mean, you know, you might have found you get the point. Some nicotine down. And so, oh, long haul is brutal. It's brutal. So nineteen point two hours. We oh. land in Hickam. We land at Hickam, and we had a flight engineer. <laughs> Who, who gave him a flight oh, engineer geez. check ride on the way over. And the loadmaster, yeah, oh, yeah, the loadmaster that I'm flying with, he's the chief loadmaster who's a no, – just saying he's an ex-Marine, ex-marine Woody. Come on. Uh, oh, you're right. You're 100% <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I just know. wanted to make sure it you never, catch it that. Never gets I knew old. you would. <laughs> and, and so we land in Hickam. We get to the hotel. We're staying right there in Waikiki Beach. And at the time – if you walked right up the main drag from the hotel, you'd end up at this little bar called the Red Lion. And you walk downstairs into the Red Lion is just littered with hundred dollar or not hundred dollars dollar bills everywhere, but there literally was thousands of dollars yep. on the walls of this place. And pilots, engineers, myself, the other load masters, they didn't come out. We go in, and we're hanging out, drinking some beers. Celebrating the engineer getting uh, his check you know, ride. qualified yeah. on his check ride. Passing his check ride. And, and, and then it's like, all right, cool. Well, the engineers leave and we're like, all right, well, let's start going out. <laughs> and so the three pilots and I, we come out and we're standing out in the, in the front of the red lion. And, and there's a couple, there's a couple of young military guys. I, I don't know what service they were. And they started kind of talking a little poo poo to us. And we started talking a little poo poo back. And next thing you know, I end up in a tussle with one of the guys in the middle of the street. And why we call him fighting T was because, so mind you, right. I have one sprained ankle right now. Like my ankle, like I'm, I'm dancing around in the street. Like I'm a, like, I was going to ask about the ankle me? situation. I'm like, forget that. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was bad. It was bad. But you know, I, I go dancing with this guy a little bit and we go a little blow for blow. And I, and the next thing you know, I sprained my <laughs> other ankle. <laughs> As it would be, so he goes. He goes, kind of shuffling around. I picture the knight on his oh, stumps from the it. Holy Grail. Come back after nineteen point <laughs> yeah. two hours of flying. You know what those are? You don't even. You don't even know where you're at. You're just like, all right, this is this is great, you know. And so then he goes around, and then, and then fighting T is standing off with this guy, and I'm just like, oh boy, this isn't good. And then the other pilots get in the brawl with this guy. And I'm like, man, this is really not good. And well, the fighting T just clocks this guy out of nowhere with the left. And, and then that was it. And we all scattered. And then we all go back to the hotel. No, hold on and, a second. Uh, we get yeah, back I, to the are, hotel. Are you, and, are you, oh, yeah. got, you know, arms over dude's shoulders? Are you able to walk? You got two sprained ankles. How are you? 
How did you? I'm walking. All right. I'm all adrenaline, man. I am. I am so right. like I'm. I'm just amped. Like I'm like, let's go, let's go. Well, one of the guys, he had a he had a little bit of a split on his eye. Probably needed a stitch or two. So they go, they go, they go to the hospital. And then, you know, the next morning they called me up. I said, Woody, where are you at? I said, I'm in my room. What are you guys doing? They're like, well, we just made it back from the hotel or from the, from the hospital. And I said, okay, we're back at the hotel. And I said, okay, well, let me, let me come up and see what's going on. And, 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 and so that was it. And so we had, we got in this massive bar brawl and, and, and one of the guys on the crew had to wear these big, you know, ridiculous seventies sunglasses. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, and we made it somehow oh, yeah. we made it and 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 everything was good and so the dude the dude was a great guy we ended up staying one other night uh, just because of the way it shaped out and then uh, and then we went home and and I and I looked at the chief loadmaster who was in the back of the bus when we were on our way out to get to the airplane and go home I said hey sir I said I I kind of, I kind of busted my ankles. Like I, I'm going to go home and go with the NIF, you know, duties not to include flying. Like I need, I need to go see the doc. I, my ankles are messed up and you know, we got a, we got in, we got into a little brawl with some people last night and I, I'll give credit to the Marines on this one. He looked at me and he says, Woody, he said, God dang it. He said, I love fighting. I wish I was fucking there. I whoop someone's ass. He's like, you ain't in any trouble. He's like, get home and go to the flight doc. And I was like, well, this is great. You know, because I thought I was going to be in trouble. And he's like, I would have whooped someone's ass. And it, it, it was just, <laughs> it was really fun. Uh, nonetheless, we, we flew back to Travis and, and I went to the NIF for my ankles. But uh, 19, two that's, hours later, we decided that's wrong. it was going to be a good that's, idea to get there's, a there's, That's wrong in, in so many ways. Uh, Wait a minute. Because because hobbling yeah. to the cab on one leg yeah. was was not yeah. enough. No, that wasn't <laughs> enough. Why not train the other one and get into a brawl in the middle of the street? All right, I, I got to ask you a question about uh, flight uh, Air Force flight training. Did you okay. ever yeah. have a uh, mm-hmm. a uh, flight in flight training where you thought, well, okay, this was it. This is it. I made a mistake, or I've screwed this up. This is going to be the last time I do this maneuver. It's okay if you have it. It's probably a good thing. Yeah, no, no, no. I have I have a couple. Realistically, one was my first Magoo sortie, which was like so you had I mean the pilot training syllabus is you changed say so Magoo? much. Right I I couldn't even tell you what it is. That's yeah, what's so right. what does that mean? Well, what the hell is that? So I, I, I don't, I don't, I, you know, and, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll look that up as to, I don't know why they were called Magoos, but you had the Pogo, the Pogo story or the Pogo story was pattern only. So you take a T6 out and you do right. pattern only. That's all you could do. The Magoo sorty was you had, you know, you opted yourself to a Magoo sorty because you had done the required maneuvers to opt you for that. And that was an area solo. So you got to go out to the MOA. All right. in the military operations area by yourself. And so the first, <laughs> the first time I had, a, I, I, I did a Magoo sort of was my first time going in like the advanced aerobatics portion, which wasn't anything too crazy, but it was Cuban eights, yeah. Immelman, split S's, yeah, you know, all that kind of T6 stuff. T6 Texan two. Yeah, what were you and, flying? Uh, a T6, the T6 okay. Texan two. Okay. And so, you know, I had I had just learned that day, like those maneuvers. I had read about them, and I did them with the instructor, and and then I that automatically opted me into that Magoo sortie. So the second, I, I ended up double turning. So after lunch, they said, you know, Wood, you're going back up, and I said, okay, and they're and they're like, you're going on a Magoo, and I was like, all right. And I go out, and I'm I'm out. I take off. I I climb up. I got a low. There you go. Low That's a picture of it right and, there. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So I go, I go ripping around, and I, I just hadn't had enough proficiency, having only been exposed to those okay. maneuvers first thing in the there. morning. And so <laughs> I initiated, I initiated more recoveries than I did. You know, I initiated more <laughs> nose high, nose low recoveries than I did a Cuban eight. I maybe did one Cuban eight at the end, but I initiated some recoveries. 
And then my, my formation check ride, I started out in formation and fingertip on the, in the T six, very, very tight and, and very good. And I think, I don't know what it was probably just me towards the end of the formation phase. I don't know how it just kind of got into my head that, I was like, what are we doing flying in this fingertip? So formation had its challenges for me in the fingertip. I could be at root. I could do extended trail. I could do that all day. But something about the fingertip and doing the wing overs and the wing work was. Yeah. And you know what? It's an Air Force thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's that's what we do. But you know what? I don't want you to feel bad because the Dos Gringos have a song about that. It's called Always Looking Right. And you know what? It's okay. That's right. Yeah. 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 So those those were probably the two times in pilot training where I'm like, what the hell is this? But at the same time, like I was just like, I'm still just happy to be there. So, uh, yeah. So did you say, repeat, did you say something about syrup or, or what? uh, what, I, I haven't seen his notes. About what? Oh, well, they're right, in the I'll they're in our joint thing there. I, I stuck it down in there, but yeah, it was after that was a uh, Gil- Gillum and Butterscotch, Gilliam and Gilliam Butterscotch, and the Butterscotch. fabulous four, the fabulous four plus Gilliam. Oh, there it so, is. So you know, probably just yeah, pro- probably just kind of how you guys are. You know, you 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 you've got nicknames, you've you've got stories, you've got you know things. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. The, the fab the fabulous four plus Gilliam. So it, it the let me let me tell you the characters first because you got to kind of know the characters and then and then so Gabby, All right. I remember that from my earlier. best friends. Now. Written, he was yeah. a seventeen. He, he was a C five load master. That's right. At he, the time? He's a seventeen. He, that's right. He was this. He was a seventeen year old parents' mission. Grew up in Wisconsin. Okay. Didn't have a television set. So that was Getty. Gilliam, well, let's get to Gilliam later. And then we had Tex, who's, yeah, well, a, who's another buddy of mine. That's, which is exactly Bados. why you'd call him Tex. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Well, <laughs> the, only reason, the only reason you called him Tex was because he was, he, was, he was the winner okay. at Texas right. Hold'em. He'd play poker and okay. he'd beat you okay. every time. And then we had Mike, who we ended up calling Hoach. <laughs> Short for Ho Chi Minh, I'm assuming. Was he was, was Mike it was Mike Asian <laughs> I know. of some sort? But, uh, no, he wasn't. He was not at all. Was he was he a little cammy. He, he was he was Hispanic. No, he was Hispanic, but Ho just kind of stuck. You fuckers are savage. <laughs> so <laughs> beautiful. So you had Ho myself, Woody, you had Tex, and then you had Getty. What we also nice. would call whiskey. And then Gilliam, Gilliam was just, you know, he was just another guy in the squadron that he, he was the likes of us, but we just never, we never got to hang out with him that much. So Hoach and Getty flew a bunch together. Tex and I, Augie, oh, it was Augie. Augie and I flew together a bunch. And, you know, it was kind of like people that know you, like we talked about earlier, like those guys, those two knew each other. Augie and I knew each other, but we were very different people, but we always got along really well. I ended up being a roommate with Getty. And so it ended up just becoming like Getty came up with the idea. He's like, this is the fabulous boy. Like we're all the same people And Gilliam. He's pretty close, but we just never fly with Gilliam. And he's just kind of back in the background, but he's the same guy too. And so it was a fabulous four plus Gilliam. And then the honoraries. And and so the honoraries came, you know, kind of later as guys that, you know, would be part of this fraternal group in, in whatever way that we saw fit. And it, it was very tribal, but it was it was a great group of people. So at one point, we had the opportunity that we went up to the scheduler and we were able to get Getty. Hoach and myself as the three loadmasters on a trip. And so Woody, um, when you say a trip, we're we're talking a multiple day around the world C five. We're, we're talking it. We're talking. We're talking a C five fourteen day 
aerial refuel, yeah, okay. you know, pick up a load in Charleston right. area, refuel out so, to the whole so deal, the whole nine. Repeat, this is what you and, and I so, would have called back in the day a boondoggle. Yeah. <laughs> this was a boondoggle. <laughs> this is 100%. And so we, you know, we... We, we take a 12 pack up to the, to the scheduler and say, Hey man, like, thank you. He's like, all right, I got you guys on it. You're good. And, <laughs> and so we leave and our first stop is in Riverside. That, that wasn't California. a very long trip. And, and we get, no, no, we get down there. And uh, so part of, we had a kind of a standard issued uniform too, which, which is, so we had the Navy IDT shorts, like the Navy shorts, like, little, you know, the little shirt. shorts. Yeah. We had those. We had the black shirt and then you'd wear Adidas Sambas, you know, like that was that was the standard issued operating equipment for the Fabulous Four. And so we get down the we get down the riverside and my buddy Getty, he looks at the aircraft commander. And he says, boy, it's hot out here. He's like, you mind if I take my flight suit off? And he's like, no, I don't care. So Getty takes off his flight suit. He's got on his Daisy Dukes. You know, he's got his IDT shorts. He's got on his shirt. And he puts on a bandana. And he's got on his, his flight boots. And he looked and like one of the like, village it's hot, he, literally, he literally looked and like Hoach one of the village people. Yeah, you know, 100%. So Hoach is sitting there. And he's looking at him. He's like, well, that's fine. And I'm sitting there like, well, that's fine. And next thing you know, the, the Marine guys pull up with like, you know, a big helmet, big, big gas truck and whatnot <laughs> look at him and they're like who's loading this thing and, and getty comes walking up he's like yes sir i am and boy i tell you what yeah they, they, he, they, uh, they, they looked at him like he, he was loaded one of the that damn, he he loaded it he loaded he loaded that damn airplane with all that stuff on and so so fast forward we fly we do our stuff we end up eventually on our way into spain and and the crew chief that we had well we call butterscotch and the only reason that we called him butterscotch was because getty had said this he says he just looks kind of creamy you know he's, he's a little pasty kind of pale so we oh, call him okay. butterscotch and so the crew chief on the c5 would usually sit in the back in the aft flight deck and they'd have you know they'd have two three row seats that they could lay down and 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 they could get comfortable well, so we kind of, you know, day one, like the three of us together out of the Fabulous Four, like we were just people that like, we would say stuff to you, but you really wouldn't know what we were saying. Like we, we were the, the, the kings of fucking with you, you know? And so uh. we, we were, we were fucking with butters pretty hard. And, and so we're like, okay, well, cool. So we ended up, we ended up going in and eventually we had to go down to, Insert like Turkey, and we had to pick up some ordnance. And we go into Insert like, and we go park at the hot spot, and we're loading up this ordnance. Well, we had some time, so we get we get transportation to come pick us up. And Butters, Hoach, Getty, myself get in the van, and we go out to the BX, and we get Burger King, and we all somehow at some point had to end up in the bathroom. To just go, you know, relieve ourselves. I come out, Getty comes out. And then at some point, Hoach comes out. And then Hoach, Getty, and I go outside to rip a heater and smoke cigarettes. And we start talking to this guy. He's like, oh, yeah, where are you guys from? And they're like, oh, we're from we're from Castle Air Force Base. We're telling them that we're from a bunch of closed Air Force bases. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 I know Castle. And we're like, you're such an idiot. But we're just <laughs> messing with this guy, you know. And then we're sitting there and like, where, where'd, uh, where'd Butters go? We don't know where Butters went. And so Getty and Hoach were like, Woody, well, F them. Like, we're going to go back to the airplane. I'm like, hey, man, I was like, we need to make a page for him or something. You know, like, we need to find where he's at. And so I go into the passenger terminal, which is where the Burger King was. And I said, hey, could you make a page right now for Staff Sergeant Butterscotch? And and they do they Beijing. make a page. Beijing. He doesn't come out. Yeah, Sergeant Butterscotch. Yeah, Butterscotch. They make they make another page. Nothing. And they're like, Woody, we gotta go. Like we're taking off in an hour. And I'm like, dude, this isn't right. Like this isn't right. We're leaving him here. I don't know if he's here. Maybe he went back. I don't know. So we get back. I'm like, fine. So we get we get in the van, 
and and the van takes us back out to the jet and we're at this hot spot and the engineer is out front we call him angry troll so at for short and he's standing out front smoking a cigarette reading his book i say hey i said do you see butters come back here he says no no i hadn't seen him i'm like man this isn't good you know, pilots come out of the bunk. They're starting to do everything. They start flipping switches, call for before starting engine checklist. And I'm like, hey, I was like, Butters, our crew chief is not here. And Hoach and Getty are sitting there laughing. They're like, he'll never fucking be late again. We're going <laughs> to fucking leave him. And I'm like, this isn't right. I was like, I was like, how about we take his bags and put his bags out? And the aircraft Taking commander's shit like, nope, us. we're starting up. We're leaving. I was like, man. I was like, this is fucked up, man. This is fucked up. So we start up all the motors. We start taxiing out. And right before the lineup checklist, I'm sitting at the aft flight deck, and Hoach and, and Getty are just chuckling this up. And next thing you know, outside of the boiler room, the boiler room is, is where the C5 environmental system was, so these big, massive packs. The boiler room door opens up, and out walks Butterscotch. And he says, hey, 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 got you guys. Oh, he's hiding from you fuckers all the time. You little. (laughs) He was hiding from us the whole time in the boiler room. And so we take off and run our way down to Kuwait. And uh, (laughs) we're on our way down into Kuwait. And get it. He's like, man, I can't can't clear my ears. And we land in Kuwait, and Getty's like, I got to go see a flight doc, man. My ears are messed up. I can't clear my head. So Getty and I are walking around this tent city in Kuwait. We finally find a flight doc who hands him, like, a stick of Motrin and and, and some Sudafed and said, yeah, just rub take it. these, and you'll rub be fine. Rub some dirt in it. It'll be all right. We go to the hotel. That's it. Yeah. Rub some dirt in it. You'll be fine. So the next morning, <laughs> we get the bus from the hotel to go out to the airplane. Well, Getty shows up. Mind you, cowboy kid from Wisconsin. He shows up. He's in civilian clothes. He's got cowboy boots, jeans on, cowboy hat, and his shirt on. And I said, Kenny, I said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm the NIF, right? <laughs> Duty's not to include flying. So he's like, I'm a passenger, right? No, you're like, not. We're in the middle of Kuwait, and he shows up and says, yeah. But it's nonetheless, <laughs> the aircraft commander looks at him, and that was the thing. That was the part of the fabulous four plus Gilliam. It's like, you would look at us, and you're not going to win. You get nothing on us. Like the aircraft <laughs> yeah. commander looked at him. And he's like, I don't know if you're supposed to do that. And he's like, well, tell me where I can't. And and he's like, get on the bus. I don't care get at on this the, point. Get on the bus. So, so get <laughs> on the bus. So we get on the airplane and, and Butters is still sitting back there, just chumming it up. Like he's the winner. And <laughs> Getty <laughs> grabs all these MREs and he's getting out all the desserts. Cause we didn't get box lunches. You know, it was wartime, whatever. So they gave us cases of MREs to go down to the desert. And he just starts eating all the desserts. He eats like three packs of Skittles, four pound cakes. And he's sitting there. He's like, Woody, he's like, I don't feel so good. I was like, you just ate all the fucking desserts. Yeah. And you're not going to crap for a month, by the way. No, no. <laughs> so, so we take off and, 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 and we, we lock butters into the courier well, compartment. Wait, we lock hold on a second. There. Nice. And courier compartment, down like and, secrets and, compartment? Mm-mm. That aft flight deck portion ah, I was talking okay. about, you, you close the door. In. Okay. We locked them in it. In the meantime, I laid down and Getty makes a chalk outline of a dead body laying down and we taped off the flight deck and the aircraft commander comes back to take a leak. He's like, what the fuck are you guys doing? And we're like, don't worry about it. Don't ask questions. You don't want to worry about Butters is locked up in the back where he belongs. So we end up in Spain again. And then, you know, we, 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 we party, we do our thing. And then on the way back now, this was the 332,500 pounds of gas back to Travis. 13 and a half hour flight. And so we load up and we start flying back to Travis. And I said, you know what? And I was like, I think we should get butters back right now. So the crew chiefs carried this toolbox, just a quick, you know, immediate toolbox to get into some stuff if they needed to. And, and so I set it down in the middle of the floor in the cargo compartment. And I put probably about 25 chains on it probably about 15 straps on it and just ratchet it down to the floor. And AT, the flight engineer, he's standing in the cargo compartment reading his book, smoking a cigarette. He's laughing. He puts a couple ties on the 
on the on the ratchet and we land and Travis and I had wrote Butters a note that I said, you might have won the battle in Siganella. I was like, but you will never win the war against the fabulous Ford plus Gilliam. And I put that note right underneath one of the chains on top of his toolbox. And we landed Travis and Butters comes down and he's looking around. He's like, where the fuck is my toolbox? Oh, I, I said, I don't know. You might want to look around. And he finds it. And boy, he got he got redder than the, the red hot and the <laughs> yeah. oh red hot yes, back. Sir. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh and 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 uh, and we made our point very clear. And that was probably one of the establishing points of the fabulous four, four plus Gilliam. In the meantime, I, I should rewind a little bit prior to that even happening. We were in Marone getting ready to go back to Travis that day. And we saw another C5 and we walked over to that airplane and that was the airplane that Augie and he was on with Gilliam. So we walked up onto the airplane and we saw those guys. Hoach immediately goes to the oven because the oven's running and he opens up the oven and there's like a a tray full of taquitos. And so Hoach pulls out the taquitos, wraps them up in a napkin. He's like, I'm going to eat some of these taquitos. And Nonetheless, that was the fabulous four plus Gilliam. The whole group was on that airplane. And Hoach has this little napkin full of taquitos. And another little side story was one of the co-pilots on that airplane, he comes walking back while we're all sitting back there gallivanting around. And and Hoach hands him his taquitos and said, hey, he's like, you want a taquito? He says, no. He said, I, I got a couple in the oven. He says, okay. Hoach had literally pulled his taquitos out and offered him his own food. <laughs> 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 and, and and there's a great picture. I'll, I'll find a way to get it to you. But uh, that was the fabulous right. four plus Gilliam. Now and, listen. And butter scotch. You've been fucking rambling on about all kinds of shit, which, which has been great. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> However, I do that. I don't know if you've lost track of time or not. We've been at this an hour and forty three minutes. You haven't. You haven't. Tell tell I'll me a that. flying story. Tell me a flying story from flying C one thirties, because that's that's what you're a pilot. Okay. Uh huh. That's what I'm a pilot on. Well. Pilot here, uh, pilot there, pilot in the C one hundred and thirty. I I I happen to know you did a combat got, tour in the C one hundred and thirty. I so, I did. so do you have any, sure do you have any stories uh, with, from that first combat tour as a pilot? You've been a you've been in you've been in a with, lot of combat situations you. as a loadmaster. With you, God dang! So you know, I had yeah so. You know, I you know I, I was very fortunate to to obviously go to pilot training and do ever, everything that I was able to do. I did some hurricane relief, and then and then I and then I went out on my first deployment with Fig. And you know, I had I had high hopes and aspirations of just like you know what I'm I'm going to get a job on base and try and get paid and, and do some stuff. And, and at the time, Fig was a squadron commander, and I was his co-pilot. And I'll never forget being on the bus in Siganella. Rhoda. Uh, no, it wasn't Siganella. We were in Crete. Was it going or no, coming? Yeah, it was. No, 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 no. No, it was Suda. We were in Suda Bay on the way over. Suda Bay on the way over, and we were in the bus on the way to the hotel and fig looks at me and he says, Woody. So I hear you're, you're, you're applying to be a government scheduled employee over at the, over at the tax school. And I said, yeah. He says, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that? What do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to be an airline pilot. He's like, you're not going to do it over there. He's like, by the way, he's like, why didn't you come talk to me about this? And I'm like, God dang it. He's right. And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I felt like a little kid. And nonetheless, you know, we really got into some conversations and, and I withdrew my application and, and we started talking about, you know, big picture overall in the future. And, and so I was like, well, this is, this is good. This is good. I'm, I'm with the guy 
And right now, like, I'm going to have a great opportunity to learn a lot of stuff. And so we get in and, and we in process and we do all this. I got, I got to tell the blood. I'm not telling the blood shit story. You want a blood shit story? I'll tell you the blood shit story. What, what is a blood shit? Yeah. What is a blood the shit? blood shit. Okay. You know, the blood shit. The blood shit's a little piece of some stuff that you get that, you know, if – you get you get you get a blood shit, which is essentially like if you got if if you got stuck somewhere, you'd hand someone a blood shit, and and they may give you a, you know it says hey I'll give you a goat if you turn you end up thing, get them in the end safe end up not place. in your aircraft and not in friendly territory. The blood shit, which was written in multiple languages, right. would would say hey I'm a down I'm a down airman. If you get me you'd give them back to friendly shit. territory, you'll be you'll be rewarded with you know whatever, right? So they call it blood. That's shit. right. So our first combat mission, I remember we had a CNI dog from Savannah and we take off and, and, and we're, we're doing kind of this round robin through Iraq and boy, I tell you, it got, it got spicy and, and we landed eventually in Baghdad and I realized, I don't know where my blood shit went. And so the bloodshed went yeah. missing, and, which was a control. Uh, which was a controlled item. Long story right. longer. That was a controlled item. It, it got kind of written off at the end of the day. But here, here was the thing that was the best about always flying with with Fig. Is I can arguably say that probably seventy uh, percent. I'm no Chuck Yeager. But I'll say that right now, about 70% of why I'm okay is because of, of flying with Fig. And, and, and it was really because he, he let me keep the bar kind of low. <laughs> but he told me some things that were things that I was never really truly paying attention to. Like how to, how to not land a C-130 in a crab was you looked at this cross oh beam God. from the window and you look at this cross beam from the windshield wiper, and eventually that draws a line down that's a little bit dead center to the left of your zipper. And that's how you can determine runway center line. And, and he taught me that. And, that, you know, we all have moments where someone taught you something that stuck that you're just like, wow, that's really cool. And, and you get to pass those moments on. And, and that's one thing I always pass on to anyone that I fly with that's a new guy that lands in a crab or something. I said, hey, let me tell you the center line demonstration. And so I would land. And Fig always had this clever way of saying, Woody, that was a really, really nice touchdown. Really, really nice approach and landing. Maybe just a little bit of a crab. Don't let it go to your head. There's plenty of room for improvement. And <laughs> And I would always sit there and I'm like, God dang it, man. Are you kidding me? That was like, if I was an airline pilot, like that was the smoothest landing ever. So, so we had, we had, we had some, we had some really, really great times. I think probably one of the biggest ones that stands out was when we flew up and I had the opportunity to sit in the left seat because I was just a co-pilot and I was in the left seat and, and we had taken off out of our base in Kuwait, and we were going up to a base in Jordan, and we were supposed to land there and then go to another base in Jordan, Amman, which was the actual international airport. And we took off, and we're on our way up, and we're going into the first base, which was a, pl a place that we hadn't been to. And uh, weather forecast was marginal, and we're flying in, and I'm just coming across the base, and, and the, the ground controller calls us up, and he's like, hey, man, he's like, we're zero, zero down here. And I'm just like, all right. And, and Fig doesn't say anything. He's just like, all right, I'm, I'm just flying along. And we come screaming across, and I, I kind of rock the wings and look down as we get over the field, and, and you couldn't see anything. It was just red dust bowl. <laughs> and I, it was a great lesson learned because Fig looked at me. And he's like, well, I'll tell you what. He's like, we couldn't have landed there even if we wanted to because he never slowed down to configure. 
And I was like, touche. I was like, you're right. Always 100% be ready to land if you've been told to do something. You know, in the airlines, you do that all the time. You take off, you're going to land. There is no, we're canceling because the weather is forecasted to be bad. You don't do that. You will take off and you will land at your destination if you you're don't always gonna you're go. go somewhere else. You're always going to go. And, and so that was one of the biggest, like this sortie was probably one of the bigger lessons learned, I feel like as far as being a C-130 pilot that I, that I truly had. And then, so now we're going over to Amman and Amman was, it was normally one way in and one way out. And if I'm not mistaken, it was six and two, four were the runways and two, four was, if you came in a high level, they wanted you to fly the full procedure ILS into land and runway two, four. And that day in question, again, this weather system was all over the place it had forced us, not forced us, but the only approach available was the ILS full procedure to two four circle to runway six. And there's terrain. And there's all houses. Over the place. There's houses on. And all I'm the in the terrain, left seat. Apartment buildings. There's houses everywhere. Like it is. It is like I'm. I'm. I'm a new guy. I'm a first lieutenant. I'm like. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not good at flying the airplane. I'm. I'm. You're lucky if I know where we're at. You know what I mean? Like, I, I know the airfield is there. And if I don't know, I'm going to 120 why I'm going to ask the engineer, like, what's going on? I'm going to ask the navigator, like, where the fuck are we? And, and we go over <laughs> and we do the full procedure, come down and circle. And I'll never forget. I'm, I'm sure you remember this, Fig. You know, you look and I mean, we're literally right there next to a whole bunch of, you know, terrain, houses and whatnot. And, and, and roll out and Fig's just kind of like, he doesn't say anything, which I think was, I think part of the, some of the great reasons of how we were able to fly so good was Fig only said something when it was getting egregious, which I tried to think that I didn't make anything too egregious. But I'm coming around and I roll out on final and I land and we touch down and we both kind of look at each other and, and I'll never forget that day of like, you do that stuff in the sim. Like you don't do that yeah. every time. Like that's not something that you do. Hells no. <laughs> Hells no. You know what I mean? And if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it in a sim and you're gonna do it on one engine or three engines. Like this was like, oh shit, like we have to do the full procedure. Like I have to remember how to time and whatnot. And so that's one of those huge moments in the C one thirty that I, I remember that approach very We gotta very we gotta wrap this up, but I, I wanna tag team this story with you because I I need uh I need a witness and you're you're the witness and you're gonna tell it from your point of view. God and, and, right. and many a good that's war right. story was but ruined by a is, witness. So. This is a really good war story. <laughs> tell tell the tale of the gun runners. How how did how did our crew become so. known as the gun runners? <laughs> oh, man. So uh, you know out of where we were at in, in Ali Asalim was, you know, you, you either you call it the pain train was first of all, like go bang out five sorties and then come home. And that was the pain train. Otherwise you went and did some stuff. And I think in this particular day in question, we took off out of Kuwait and I believed we went to, I feel like it was Baghdad. Or maybe we went somewhere else. We went to Baghdad. Well, so, so if I and, remember correctly, it was Salim Baghdad. But we were going from Baghdad up to Erbil, which was Erbil. You know, and it, 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 they didn't consider themselves right. part of Iraq. Neutral. Right. neutral so whenever we were going from Baghdad place. to there, the little old colonel or general got on. Right. Yeah. So we had we had literally taken off. From Kuwait, we we land in Baghdad, and we had you know we pick up some guys in Baghdad, you know, beards, SF, like you know these these guys that you see in in the movies, you know, what civilian I mean? they're, clothes. They're, they're civilian they're the clothes. guys that you're like, they're gonna go do yeah, they're gonna go do some stuff. You know what I mean? These are the special and, uh, operators. They're the special operators. So they bring on they bring on this you know ISU ninety internable slingable unit. 90 out doesn't of matter. 90 it's, not, it's not important Maybe to the story. But, but what is important to the story is we had like three pallets 
worth of office furniture that we True. hauled up from Kuwait. Office furniture. Office it, it, furniture. it even had pictures okay. of chairs well, you know. and desks office. and shit like that on the boxes of these office. three giant pallets. Office yeah. furniture. Okay. The customs guy in Baghdad says, well, I want to open one of these up. He opens it up. There's not a lot of office furniture in there. There's a couple of pieces, maybe like a chair or two, but in the back, like there's like there's optics. Like there are things that, that are that are in the back that that this is not just all office furniture. Maybe a pallet got I'm, switched somewhere. Yeah, that's, you know, not, that's all switched. I don't know, you know, A one C Snuffy mixed it up in the yard or whatever. And so, <laughs> and so we close it up and we're like, well, it doesn't matter. You know, we're, we're, we're trucking on our way up to her bill. So we, you know, we take off and we head up to her bill and, and we land and we did have a two star or something that came on, but I, I don't remember anything significant other than in that flight we landed. No, it wasn't we, until we got no, back. We landed in uh, her bill and it was, it was two. And we morning. landed in her bill and the load masters were unloading the all the pallets, and you, you know, you being a former load master, I was doing my best to keep you away from the action because you kept wanting to help. So I said, "Come on, oh, Woody, let's let's go get a cup like of coffee." Crackhead, because we had to shut down. So Three as we're walking by this area where these guys had right. unloaded the pallets with the office furniture on it. And they had a That's big spotlight right. on, on it, you know, generator with a big light. And as we walked by, they were cutting the boxes open, and there were mini guns on tripods that they were taking guns. and putting That's in right. the back of pickup trucks. Mini guns. There yes. Were, well, it office security office is chairs, a big deal, it gentlemen. Wasn't desks, it wasn't desk. <laughs> it, was it was a big was It was office guns. security. And so... It was I guns. snuck a That's picture right. as I was uh, walking by on my phone. I oh snuck a God. picture. We went and got coffee. And then the, when yeah. we got back, you know, the, the Intel, when we did our debrief with Intel, anything you say, nah, now we didn't see that. Although, you know, we, no, we you know, it's funny. The office shit. furniture we hold up there look a lot like miniguns when they open the boxes. What? You know, so, so <laughs> from, there, from then on out. We were the gun runners. We were the gun runners. We had pet. We had patches made, so we nice. like, nobody. And so even going, even going to the store to get in the patches, <laughs> like so we went up, we went up, we went up to the clothing sales store, right? So this place that was making the patches, like you know, you could go in there with a a PDF or something, and they'd make yeah. you a patch. And we were like, we want a patch that just says gun runners. We want this rectangular patch in good black lettering that says gun runners. And they're like, okay, okay, gun runner. Okay, we'll make that patch for you. Okay. You know, a Filipino, whatever, you know, yeah. you know, you get you get the gist. And so we came in. I think we had we just got bogged down flying so many missions that we, you know, the patches were ready. And so we went into the we went into the patch store that day and we're like, we're here to pick up our patches. And they said, Gun runner, you're late. <laughs> <laughs> and he hands us. And he hands, and he hands us this patch of this is this bag of patches that all say gun runners. That's on it. Them. That's, that's a picture. Of, oh, that's, God, that's, that's what that's we right. hauled. We hauled boxes that's and that's, boxes that's what we of hauled. those to Erbil. Yeah. 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 Six barrel Gatling gun. Nice. Yeah. Just yeah. And shit those out. guys with the yeah. beards that were in civilian clothes that I told you about. Yeah, that was for them. Oh man, that was their that was their equipment. That was for them. Yeah. They need to provide oh, yeah. office security. <laughs> yeah, office security. What do you mean, PC law? Yeah, ladder? right. The fuck does Bulls that mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, Woody. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, it pains me to say this, but we, we got to cut you off, dude. We've been talking forever. I, I tell you what, if it wasn't gonna be awesome. you, it'd be my, it'd be my now keeper. wife. She's keeper. You know, previous yeah. girlfriend. She's hey, a keeper. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Woody, yeah. for for your service, and thank you for spending two hours Deep. and uh, f in almost two minutes with us. Because I, I I could I I you could keep going. I know you could. And so here's the deal: like we yeah. tell all our yeah. guests, when you when you sign off today, you're going to think of six things you wish you would have talked about. So write write down the bullets. Oh, sure. Okay, write down the bullets, and then. 
If it's worth I'll a shit, that. we'll have I'll you back. That. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> all right all right only if it's worth it only if it's worth it, <laughs> only if it's worth it. all right me. well yeah. uh, i'd like to uh, yeah. uh have a salute to all of our military veterans and the families who support them in their mission she's a Including keeper bro your wife who's a and keeper. by the way today you are you are in support i mean you are you're being supported so thank you indeed well i i can't thank you guys enough for being here man that was that was really cool it's just shoot the shit with everybody and thank you Glad you are. So we all have so have a couple other thank yous we need to take care of here very very quickly. We need to thank Dave yeah. Hamilton over at the Mac Geek Gab, the Gig Gab and the Business Brain. Those are his shows. And he also runs a little outfit called Backbeat Media. Backbeat Media handles our advertising online. We appreciate that. Hey, we have a glossary. We've we've had a few terms I I'm sure that was thrown out today. I I think we tried to I think we tried to cover them all. If we didn't, uh, yeah. let us know. We'll put it in the glossary. If you heard an acronym that you're not sure of, because aviation is full of acronyms. That's right. That's and we, we have a merch store, which, by the way, I was there last night oh, buying yeah. merch. And I think I owe you some money, dude. <laughs> nice. I know. Well, when oh, it was boy. time for checkout, it <laughs> said it's on the way. And I'm like, I never put any... Any form of payment in, so I think it was your form of payment. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm well, sure. I think it probably yeah, went so off I'm, my credit card. I'm good for oh, it. You boy. know I'm good for I see how it is. But anyway, we do. <laughs> yeah, we I have a rough have idea where you live. merch store. And by the way, it's spring. So if, you're, <laughs> if you've got a significant other that's got a beach-worthy body, we have a bikini. And it's pretty hot. Yeah, we it's, do. It's a nice bikini. Yeah, we do. You can't buy half of it, oh, though. You're going to have to buy the top and the bottom. Uh, so, but we got, you know, if, it's, yeah. if we don't have it on the merch <laughs> store, it's probably not yeah. made. Yeah. Need to also thank all the folks who have supported this show. Well, I can't believe, Fig, you know, we started talking about this just a little less than two years ago. And next thing you know, we're sitting here 100. cranking out show 100. Blows my mind. Woody is 100. Yeah, 100. We couldn't have gotten there without all the folks over at Patreon. At so there I was dot us slash Patreon and the folks that contribute via our website via so there I was dot us slash donate. So either one of those places to help support us financially, yeah. Because this is not free. This does cost a lot of money to put a podcast together with any what, sort of quality. What a shock! We like to think we have a little bit of quality, and so <laughs> yeah, right. But we're only able to have that quality because of you, because all these things, a lot of subscriptions, a lot of hardware, all that stuff to edit the show and get it ready for you to listen to. It it doesn't come free. You people have taken hard earned money that's gone into your wallet and you've taken out of your wallet and thrown it at us for some unknown reason. But we're humbled and grateful. To yes. You. So, yes. So thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, in that. Sal Marinello, my brother, five time tact- tactical aircraft commander mm-hmm. and chucker. Yeah. yeah. Seven. Chucker's in a league yeah, of his own. That's the Chucker. He's at seven now. Level. And climbing. Hey. So, yeah. Got some great pictures on the website of Chucker in London this week. And uh, including he was in a bobby hat. He was out in front of the palace. Hanging out in the cockpit seven. of a uh, of an airliner. So. He he wanted to know if that was. Uh, so. <laughs> well, you fly the triple seven, however. He wasn't sure if that was configured the same way. But it looked pretty much the same from what I could see. Although it, it, it I don't know why that I was looking out the windscreen at like a, a wall, and it looked for some reason the aircraft looked smaller. So I guess seven five. I thought it was a light <laughs> twin. It was a heavy oh, twin. I so. fly the light twin. <laughs> hey, rate us, you go. rate us, so. share, rate us, and share the show. You know, if you can't give us a five star rating, Absolutely. tell us what we can do to make it a five star rating because we are trainable. And behind me on one of the cameras here, I've got an image. Actually, that was that was done by sticks. But we've got some other images occasionally I use of some Harriers and uh, several other images that have gone up on our website and into the shows have been through a guy by the name of Brad Silcott. And he's at BDSAviationPhotography.com. That's Bravo Delta Sierra AviationPhotography.com. Amazing stuff. Go check out his work. You will be impressed. Well, before we get to those guys in the background, we got a guy in the background for us, and that's 
Sticks. Oh. And Sticks is truly an unsung it's hero for So There I Was. You know, he is the smartest guy in the room. Oh, there he is. He's the smartest guy in the room, always. <laughs> Unfortunately, he flew helicopters in the Coast Guard. Uh, nope. He may be he's, smart, he's but he lacks judgment. judgment. <laughs> uh, but he is truly uh, in, in, inspirational and a, 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 a uh, integral yeah. part of this whole operation. Thank you, Sticks, for everything you do back there. Yeah, indeed, Sticks. Thank you. I can't unmute you. If you'd like to come off mute there, say thank you and, and hello and all that good stuff. Uh, there we are. There are Sticks. It's great to be here. Oh, it's, uh, I'm so excited with uh, us hitting 100 yeah. episodes. Is it crazy? Um, yeah. Yeah, we're in yeah. triple digits, baby. So if you hit the bell hey. on YouTube, you will get notifications when there we go live. Go. So uh, one more way to, to stay connected with us, like, comment, subscribe. If you haven't, do me a favor, go check out YouTube. I did put a YouTube video up, sort of an instructional video. I'd love to get some comments and feedback on that. Um, yeah, it's actually really good. I was talking about it. stalling the aircraft. And, I'm, sorry, and I'm sorry I haven't got to back to you cool yet, Stick. Uh, I, uh, nice. That's all good. You're nice. busy, man. Somebody else we need to throw a shout out to, and that's our man, Bago. Bago, Bago is also Bago. 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 Bago showed up halfway through the show. He was doing that work thing. I guess this podcasting thing Dude, is interview, in interfering with his work Bago life. Bago <laughs> is uh, uh, part of our team, and he runs our Facebook uh, page, and also is also a former Marine, constant leader, inspiration. And he says uh, to the fact that uh, Ch- uh, Sticks is our is our brains he says yeah he's uh, all brain no logic so there's some there's some to that too there you go <laughs> <laughs> and thanks i haven't looked at who's listening and who's not today i did catch oh, marcus yeah, ponte in there so it. thank you marcus and to your son sevi whose winter Sebi. coat is one of our uh, hoodies so great piece of gear yes yeah, sevi so Thank you, everybody, for listening. We're well over 5,000 a week now. Share it with two of your friends. Every one of you listening, please share the show with two of your friends. We might get to 10,000 soon. Uh, that sound you Could hear happen. in the background, that's uh, the two F-16 pilots that make the Air Force sound good. That's the Dos Gringos. And, and they got four albums out, and not a one of them has a bad song. <laughs> and, uh, and Woody needs to listen to... Uh, yeah. The Ballad of Thunderbird sure. number two. I will. He talks, I will. When he talks about flying fingertips. There you go. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> yep. All right, everybody. Thank you. Until Woody. next week. Thanks for getting us to 100. Let's do 100 more. 100 Stay more. safe and check six. 100 more. Check six. Well, there I was. Crossing the pond And you could see that I wasn't exactly fond Of all the shit I was wearing On that day Now an F-16 is cramped enough But it's even worse With all that stuff Supposed to save your life But we knew there was no way Cause when you're going down The North Atlantic, man, it's over It's what? (laughs) He said it's over Oh, man. Oh. It ain't over. We're going to do 100 more, but was the first 100 perfect? Mistakes were made. Did we give up when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? No! <laughs> <laughs> was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? <laughs> oh, boy, is this great. All right. And we are out. <laughs>